the, the DA and smaller parties, they could constitute a government, especially if the ANC, by the way, was to slip below 40%, which is not impossible. That yeah. could happen. I mean, South Africans are very angry. Yes. They cannot wait to go and punish the ANC. Yeah. An ANC president, who is a state president in South Africa, is the weakest in his second term. We have seen what happened to Mbeki. We have seen what happened to, to Zuma. So once Cyril Ramaphosa is in his second term, you will see what uh, the, the Paul Mashatile faction will do. They will fight to the death. Why? They know in any case this guy is saving his last term. So let's fight in order for us to get to, into power. Prince Mashele is a man who is loved and loathed by many people in South Africa, especially in the, some of the political parties. Uh, and he's back with us today. Prince, welcome back to the State of the Nation. Lovely to see you again. Thanks, Mike, for inviting me. I always enjoy this platform. Yeah, well, you know, um, everybody out there, I think, is enjoying the platform, so subscribe. That's the end of the lecture. Prince, yeah, we head towards an election. You know, a lot's happening. Things are moving very, very quickly. And, um, you know, a lot's changed since we last spoke. Uh, we've seen the emergence of uh, MK Party down in KZN um, and some fierce politicking. How do you see the situation at the moment? Look, <clears throat> nothing much really changed since we last spoke. And we can bracket out uh, the MK. The reason why I say nothing much has changed is because what most South Africans know, they still know, which is the ANC will not get a 50% in this election. So that we have known for some time. The entry of parties like the MK merely serve to bring down the ANC below 50%. So what that party would do, in my view, will hit the ANC in KwaZulu-Natal in the main. Outside KwaZulu-Natal, I don't actually see good prospects for the MK party. But KwaZulu-Natal is very important because that's where the numbers are. Remember, almost half of South Africa's population, just about 40, uh, 46, 45% of South Africa's population is in KwaZulu-Natal and Gauteng. So if you hit the ANC hard in KwaZulu-Natal, you hit the ANC hard in Gauteng. You can actually hold the ANC below 50%. That's essentially what explains why the ANC actually fell below 50% in the previous local government elections in 2021. So the picture hasn't generally changed. The second aspect is that since we last met, met, we actually saw the emergence of many small parties. And, and that, by the way, the story is the opposition vote is going to be split. So instead of consolidating the opposition vote, you are splitting it. But I don't think that will actually be significant. What will that will mean is that maybe the DA will get 19% or retain 20%. You will see the entry of parties like the small parties like uh, Action SA into the picture. I don't think Action SA will actually break uh, above 5%. I think there will be anywhere between 2% and 5%. So there will be a new players in that space, but the, the bigger picture is that the ANC will not get 50%. 50%. Then the question is, who governs? Uh, under under such circumstances. My prediction is that there will be a coalition government, either a coalition government of the ANC and the DA, and that is most likely, or a coalition government of the DA and smaller parties. You mean the ANC and smaller parties? No, the DA and... Well, <laughs> the, the DA and smaller parties, they could consider government, especially if the ANC, by the way, was to slip below 40%, which is not impossible. That yeah. could happen. I mean, South Africans are very angry. Yes. They cannot wait to go and punish the ANC. Yeah, but it, but it couldn't happen unless... Yeah, you The EFF is going to get above 10%, 12%. You know, some people are saying much higher. And, uh, you know, if, if the ANC is getting, let's say, 40%, that still leaves the others with less than 50%. Yes. If the ANC were to get 40%, 40 it would be very interesting. It would mean that the ANC plus two smaller parties, they wouldn't constitute a government. The ANC, under such circumstances, if it were to be part of the, the government, would need either the EFF or the DA. 
So the smaller parties in such a in such a situation would actually be in a very tricky corner in the sense that they wouldn't determine anything if the ANC were to sit around forty uh, percent uh, or even below. That is the tricky thing for smaller part parties. So the ANC would have to make a choice: is the DA or the or the um, or the EFF? And my sense is, the Cyril Ramaphosa component of the ANC would go with the DA, but. From day one, even if that component were to succeed to go with the DA, the that component, Sil Ramaphosa's component, faction in the ANC, would be under attack from day one. And I think that what would happen, Sil Ramaphosa wouldn't finish um, his term. He would actually not even finish two years. He would get to a point where he says, I don't deserve this, because they would attack him in order to make sure that this government with the DA collapses. And it would actually be attacked by the Paul Machatile faction because Paul Machatile would be number two in line in the ANC. So if the if Cyril Ramaphosa were to resign, say a year down the line, Paul Machatile automatically would become president of the ANC and and and, and, and of, of the country. What would he do? He would simply partner with the EFF and form a new government, exclude the DA. And that would be the game. Whatever happens, the answer will never be the same again. It would never recover from um, a situation where it gets under 50%. In that situation, you could almost have a return to the, the, the Cope debacle of what happens if two prominent leaders say, I am the ANC, and the other guy says, I'm the ANC, but yet the votes are accorded to that party. Who becomes custodian of those votes? That would be, that would be the battle. Essentially, the battle would, would be who buries the carcass of the ANC? Mm. Because the ANC would never recover from that, that experience. In fact, we are actually lucky to be living through this because we are witnessing the fall and the death of the ANC and the ANC will never come back. We will never again in our lifetime see the ANC as the governing party of South Africa. So if it gets into a coalition arrangement, that will be the last kick of the dying wars. In 2029, 2019, sorry, in 2029, the ANC wouldn't come back uh, into power. So they would fight for, for, for that vote. But that fight would worsen matters for the ANC in the sense that it would weaken it even further. So uh, it, the ideal situation, by the way, under such circumstances, would be for the ANC to unite in order for them to rebuild together. But they won't do it. They would fight. And in the course of the fight, they would weaken their own party and bury it. Because at the moment, it doesn't seem like there's an ideology that you can call ANC ideology. There's nothing for them to unite behind, is there? Because they're, really they're not really governing for the best will of the country or the best interests of the country. They don't really have a plan. Everything they've been doing, I suppose, for the last, certainly under Ramaphosa, has been completely reactionary. So it's hard to see what it is that they would be uh, uniting behind, other than the levers of power and the spoils of power. Uh, the, the main business in the ANC now is this. What do I get out of it? Every leader of the ANC is asking themselves that question. What do I get out of it? And with whom must I partner in order for me to get something? That's the main business of the ANC. There's no ideology. Forget about ideology. The ANC no longer has any ideology. And in fact, no one these days in the ANC wastes time debating ideology. If you are raising ideological questions, they just ignore you. They think you are mad. It's about what do they get out of it. So if, for example, Sir Ramaphosa were to go with the DA after the elections, the Paul Machatile faction and those who are around Paul Machatile would say, we have lost how do we make sure that we fight in order for us to get back to power, in order for us personally to benefit? That's what the game is about. So the ANC as an ideological organization, it's long dead. It doesn't exist anymore. It's about people who are trying to make money using the ANC to gain access to state resources, period. Now, we understand that uh, within the ANC, you've got a Ramaphosa faction as it's put forward and a Mashatile faction as it's put forward. Um, the, I want to ask you two questions, and I'll ask them both to you before you, you answer. And that is that um, I'm, I'm, I'm quite confused, and I do a lot of this. What does the Ramaphosa faction stand for? Because he has been slightly worse than Jacob Zuma, one would imagine. It doesn't look like there's an ideology. When he came along, 
leading up to the 2019 election. This was meant to be, be a so-called pro-business government. He's been unbelievably anti-business, right? He's, he's not really a communist kind of leader like we've had in the past. So I'm, I'm struggling to see, A, what his ideology is, A, and secondly, who are in which corner? Because all I know is, yeah, you've got Cyril Ramaphosa and yeah, you've got Mashatile, and I'd imagine those dinners are quite awkward when they sit there because uh, they're both, uh, you know, the, the one's trying to invite Julius Malema all the time and the other one, I'm not sure what he does. Do you know what the ideology is of uh, Cyril Ramaphosa faction and who supports him? Look, <clears throat> Cyril Ramaphosa, as a leader, as a person, his ideology is capitalism. It's pro... Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. No, well, Certainly not based on anything he's done. No, no, no. no. He's been terribly anti-business. No, 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 no. But he has actually been in business himself and he has made money from capitalism. By the way, um, he, he, has, he, he has never promoted uh, socialism or, com or communism. So well, he has he, with the NHI. Uh, you know, he has... No, NHI is not a socialist. Well, it depends on how you want to look at it, by the way. I mean, there is an NHI in the UK. Would you argue that the UK is a, is a socialist country? Certainly not. We can get into a debate about, it, about that. By the way, Western but, Europe, Western yes. Europe, as you know, Western Europe, uh, the whole of it, you can take Scandinavian countries, by the way. You, they are not socialist countries, those countries. They are actually yes, capital, capitalist, capitalist countries. countries, but they've got a very strong social intervention uh, orientation in their politics. Yes. So but the one reason why I would call that socialist is, is almost yeah. because it's not so much the establishment of NHI. You can say that we've got that right now because we've got public health facilities. Right? We understand that. So we've already got it in place. What's unique about NHI is that it's going to outlaw private pre private sector. No, <clears throat> look, I, 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 unless if you want us to debate the details of NHI, yeah. but I thought you were asking a, an, yeah, I'm, I'm saying, an I, ideological I question okay, to so try and... So we are saying that he's uh, pro-markets. I, I, I think so. Okay. And by the way, this NHI thing, it's not Sil Ramaphosa's thing. It's been there before Sil Ramaphosa. The debate about the NHI in the ANC, by the way, and that's what people tend to forget, precedes Sir Ramaphosa as the president of the ANC. I was going to um, make another point. He has been defeated. It, it is not that he believes in uh, socialistic policies. He believes in actually business-friendly policies, but he is a weak leader. He has been defeated by people who, in very commas, are in his faction. People who are in um, Sir Ramaphosa's faction actually don't respect him. They are not even loyal to him. All they want is access to power through him. So he, they actually view him as an instrument that they can use to access power. Who is they? You're talking about people like Gwede. I mean, remember, Gwede saved Ramaphosa. Ramaphosa yeah. had actually decided to, to, to resign over the Palapala scandal. He actually wrote a resignation speech. He had even issued a media alert for him to stand up and say, I resign. It is actually Gwede and others who say, went to him and said, you are not going to resign. Why did Gwede do so? It's not because he believed in Ramaphosa, but it's because people like Gwede understood that if Ramaphosa were to go, they themselves may actually would not have come back into, into cabinet. So the people who are around Ramaphosa are around Ramaphosa not because they believe in him, but simply because they view him as a useful instrument that they can use to maintain themselves in power. So, substantively, there is nothing called a Ramaphosa faction. He doesn't command any support, number one. Uh, those who are around him, as I said, they actually don't support him. So, he is actually a very weak leader. He, he failed to marshal the forces that are, that are behind him. So, he is not leading his inverted commas faction. He is actually being pushed forward by his inverted commas faction. That's the problem. So, the Ramaphosa faction is his weakness as a leader. And uh, who, who then fights for Ramaphosa? I mean, Gwede must be just about on the way out, one would imagine. You know, he obviously can't shake off the scandals. Um, he's been a very bad minister. 
Uh, I, I'm, I, all I'm saying is that if the ANC is going to split, you're going to need, you're going to have these factions coming up, like you had back in the uh, the old days of the Zuma faction and the Mbeki faction. At least you could see who they were, and there were some people with a bit of energy on both sides. I can't see who those people with energy are that are pro Ramaphosa. You mentioned Gwedi, cool, but he's seventy, he's a thousand years old, right? Uh, who else? Other uh, than him, they the younger people like Ronald Lamula. Um, um, I mean, without Ramaphosa, arguably Ronald Lamula wouldn't be minister. Mm. Uh, Ramaphosa lifted this young man and put him in, in, in into cabinet. And I'm sure that such young ministers, yes, uh, would hope that Sir Ramaphosa comes back you, in order for them to go back to, to you, cabinet. You pick the one that was Malema's big mate, right? Yeah, but they, the they, they fall out. They follow. I mean, yeah. there are many people in the ANC who were who were Malema's mates. I mean, yeah. people like Figil and Balula, for example. Yeah. They were personal friends. They were drinking together. Yeah. So really, if we're going to use Malema as a yardstick, okay. we'll find that everyone at some point. Okay. So do you think they'll have there'll be enough of what we can call the Ramaphosa faction to fight off the Mashatile faction? I think there will be. The the Mashatile faction, by the way, what we call the Mashatile faction, is also very weak. It, it would actually be very difficult to identify individuals who are willing to raise up their hands and say, I am going to fight for Mashatil. They are very weak. Mashatil still needs to build that, that faction. And they are very scared that if Ramaphosa, who is still in power, if he were to come back and in a situation where they would have identified themselves quite clearly as supporters of um, Mashatil, they would actually be dealt with even in the context of a coalition government. In other words, mm. most of them would not get, would not go, go back to their, to their positions. Remember, as we speak, the people we call the Mashatile faction have positions either in cabinet or in the provincial government and, and so on. So they are going to be very careful. They're not going to fight openly. They will fight openly after the elections because they would know that in any case, Sid Ramaphosa would be saving his last term. Remember, an ANC president who is a state president in South Africa is the weakest in his second term. We have seen what happened to Mbeki. We have seen what happened to, to Zuma. So once Sidi Ramaphosa is in his second term, you will see what uh, the, the Paul Mashatile faction will do. They will fight to the death. Why? They know in any case, this guy is saving his last term. So yeah. let's fight in order for us to get to, into power. But all things being said, that means that whichever coalition they enter into is going to be quite a weak coalition. There's no question about it. It's going to be a very weak and turbulent coalition. On the one hand, it's going to be pulled to, to the left um, or to not even the left, to chaos by the faction that wants to take over from Ramaphosa, that is the Paul Mashatile faction in the ANC. On the right, it will be pulled very forcefully by the DA who are going to say, you're not going to do this, you're not going to do that. Because also the DA would like to press on, on, on brakes and get something out of the coalition government. So this is going to be a very chaotic and unstable government, uh, even if it's uh, the coalition of the DA and the, a, and, the a, and the ANC. And of course, what will suffer will be the economy uh, and services. Well, the economy and services are already suffering. Yeah. <laughs> already suffering. But... I would I'll put my head on the block. It would still be a better devil. Why? Under the current circumstances, you have the ANC. I mean, the ANC is one of the most chaotic parties in, in, in South Africa as we speak. Um, They're not making any progress. They have collapsed um, state-owned enterprises. They have collapsed roads. They have collapsed hospitals. They have collapsed education and, and, and so on. Alone, sitting alone in one boardroom. So if you've got an outsider who's going to sit in that boardroom, right? That outsider at least is going to disturb the pace of, 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 of collapse. Yeah, right. So if you were to have the DA in the, in the boardroom, the DA would say, whoa, 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 you shall stop. You are not going to do that. So I think it would be a better devil in that sense, unstable as it would be. Okay, so let's turn our attention then to uh, some of the other battlegrounds because um, you, there, there's also going to be a contestation for some of the provinces. Now, um, we already know that, uh, you know, the DA is not holding on to a massive margin down in the Western Cape. I think they had 54% in the last election. And uh, they seem to be hemorrhaging um, some votes, especially outside of the greater Cape Town area, 
to organizations like the Patriotic Alliance and even good. And we know that both of those parties will just give their votes to the ANC. That we know. I mean, they, they, they say one thing, but they do another, and we can see that. Do you think the DA is going to hold on to a majority in the Western Cape? I think they, they, they are likely to hold on to a majority, but a very slim one. They will decline. Could be 51% plus. They are not, I don't think they will grow, given what you have, you have said. Even if they don't, say they get 48%, they will still lead a coalition government. The ANC in the Western Cape has no chance of coming of coming back. Remember, they are under 30% mm. as we speak. Yes. I mean, to climb from 30% to 51%, it's impossible, number one. Number two, even if they were to gain, say they, they reach 30%, they would not be able to put together a coalition government. So the only party in the Western Cape that can either lead a coalition government or lead the province is the DA. So I actually don't see the DA losing power in the, yes. in, in the Western Cape. Yeah, and so, let's 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 talk about the other battlegrounds. <clears throat> KZN, that one seems to be quite murky. What is your view of what's going to happen in KZN? The <clears throat> ANC is going to lose uh, its majority in KZN provincially. If you look at the previous local government election, the ANC declined from the mid fifties to forty one percent. I mean, that's huge. If you throw in uh, the emergence of uh, MK Pat, which rides on the back of um, Jacob Zuma, you can tell without, um, with, with certain, almost with certainty that the ANC will not touch 50%. So I see the ANC declining to below 40% in, in KZN. And I see by-elections are telling us already that the IFP has been growing. So remember that at some point, the IFP was governing KZN in the beginning, early 90s. Yes, governing and, it very badly. But yeah, very badly, it. but they were governing nonetheless. Yeah. The ANC rose to the extent where they actually wrestled power in KZN in the main on the strength of Jacob Zuma. In the main on the strength of Jacob Zuma. Now that Jacob Zuma has broken out of the ANC, I see a component of the of the electorate in KZN following him, but I also see a component of the electorate returning back to the IFP, and by-elections are telling us that. So I see the, the, the IFP being the leader of a coalition government in, in, K, in KZN and the ANC occupying opposition, opposition benches. So if you put together the IFP and Jacob Zuma's uh, um, MK, the DA may be part of that, of that project, Action SA, I think we are likely to have a coalition government. Do you really think that MK with a Jacob Zuma figure hanging over it is not there to try and, uh, I mean, I could hardly see him sitting in the same room as DA people. No, he can. No, 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 he can. You, I think you're mistaken. People don't understand what what is it that drives Jacob Zuma so mad about his, his ANC. It's in Ramaphosa. You know, Jacob Zuma interprets things personally. In his, in his head, Sir Ramaphosa threw him into jail. That's how Jacob Zuma functions. He sees a head of state as a king, that a head of state can get whatever they want. So his interpretation of his imprisonment post-1994 is that he was imprisoned by Sir Ramaphosa and he wants to revenge. So if he were to be in a situation where there is a possibility of a coalition government in KZN, with the DA to punish Sir Ramaphosa, I can tell you Jacob Zuma would run into that boardroom and say, let's do it. Mm. So he wants to punish Sir Ramaphosa. It's, it's a personal war as far as he sees it. Yeah, he might be, be a bigger flip-flopper than uh, Julius Malema, one would imagine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Is, I mean, Jacob Zuma is not a man of principle. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, I don't know what principle Jacob Zuma stands for. Uh, no, don't worry, he's got principles, and if you don't like those, he's got other <laughs> principles. But let's let's talk about some of the other battlegrounds working our way up the country. The Free State is alive suddenly. Am I right? The, the ANC has, doesn't have a massive majority either, and um, their governance there seems to have just got progressively worse. Yeah, but there are other parties in the Free State, and that's the problem, are weak in the Free State. Yeah. So the ANC 
has the field alone. It's not going to grow. It's, it will decline marginally. But my sense is that the ANC will retain the, the, free, the free state. Okay. But the free state as a province doesn't have human beings. It has got land. Yeah. So it doesn't really influence the national picture. It's more or less like the Northern Cape. Yes. And then, of course, the big boy, which is Gauteng. Now, at the moment, we've got uh, um, Panyaza Lasufi doing some things that must be borderline illegal, one would imagine, some of the things that he's promising and uh, some of the things that he's actually done. You know, I know that they retrofitted his, uh, his uh, Ama Panyaza, Ama the, 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 the so-called police wardens or whatever it was, and they backfilled. La Mola almost changed the laws to allow them to operate. Uh, you know, he seems to be completely, oh, the guns on automatic, that guy's just shooting into the air with anything, making promises of money, jobs, the whole lot. Do you think that's going to work? It's not going to work. <clears throat> the guy is not mad, by the way, he's very rational. He's a good analyst. <laughs> he can sit in my chair. He has looked at the trend in the ANC in his province, Gauteng, and he knows that the ANC is exiting. If you look at the previous um, uh, provincial elections, the ANC struggled to break above the 50% mark. It got 50% plus. So the ANC nearly lost. So he is aware that the ANC is likely to lose in Gauteng. So what, what is his response? He is to be populist and try and offer whatever he can offer to the electorate in order for the for the electorate to to be merciful towards the AN, to the towards the ANC but it's not going to succeed the angriest people are in Gauteng. if you listen to national debate whether there is a pitfall latrine i mean a pit lat, a child who falls in the pit latrine in Lipomp, the loudest voices that uh, uh, make noise about that are people in Gauteng. Because Gauteng has the largest concentration of the middle class, both black and white. So these are the most informed. Um, uh, this is the most informed stratum of society. So he's aware of that he's trying to be populist in order to respond to that. I don't think it will work. Why? Look at the trend, local government elections from 2016 to 2021. You can see that the ANC is declining. I don't see anything that is going to change that trend. So Panyaza Lusufi is left with a few months, really. After the election, he will not be premier of, of Gauteng. He's simply kicking and screaming, trying his best. Yeah, he probably a, a role in cabinet awaits him, I presume. He, at least he shows some energy, and uh, he's Mashatile's mate. So. There will be a problem, by the way, uh, even for him, if there's a coalition government. Mm. Uh, say there's a coalition government. Remember, if there's a coalition government, a good 40% of the ANC ministers will not come back. They will be without jobs. So there will be a very intense competition for jobs um, in the ANC. I actually don't see anything that would elevate Panyaza to cabinet. So Cyril Ramaphosa would have to decide, do I look within my current pool of cabinet ministers? Do I bring other others from outside. It's going to be a very tough one in the context of a reduced um, uh, electoral outcome. So, so, so Panyaza may actually not get a, a cabinet position because it's going to, the competition for positions will be, will be very tough. Hmm. Now, Prince, um, there's been a lot of discussion about, uh, you know, in some polls put the DA and the EFF very close um, in second spot, even with the decline in the ANC. Um, but there's been some talk even about the EFF surpassing the DA in this election. Uh, what do you think of it? Look, <clears throat> I, I agree with Paul's, by the way, and obviously I've been following Paul's, that the EFF is going to grow uh, very seriously in this, in this election. Why? There are two types of voters who vote the EFF. One is a youth component that is uneducated, unemployed, and hopeless. You find such people in informal settlements, such as Deep Sloot, Alexandra, and, and, and elsewhere. I don't see these people stopping uh, from voting from the EFF. And, and typically such a vote traditionally would go to the ANC. 
So in other words, the EFF takes from the from the ANC. The second uh, category of voters who vote the, the EFF. The, the middle class, black middle class to be specific, who are very angry with the ANC and they want to use the EFF to punish the, the, the ANC. I mean, there is no shortage of angry South Africans. And I am definitely sure that there is no shortage of angry black middle class South Africans. So the, the EFF is likely to get the votes that will move, that will swing from the ANC and going elsewhere. So I think that the EFF will grow. Polls, the latest I saw from Ipsos, places the EFF at 18%. I don't think they will touch 18%. There could be around 15%, 16%, or even anywhere between 13% and and 17%. That's my, my my prediction. So yes, the EFF will grow. I don't think they will surpass the DA. The DA may stagnate or even regress marginally. But the DA voters are very loyal. They go out and vote. And I think this time around, they will go out. They understand the game of numbers. So I don't see the DA really declining marginally. But I actually also don't see the EFF surpassing the DA. Yeah. Interestingly, the DA is the one party now that is that officially won't come on to my show. Um, Mr. Stianazen doesn't like some of the things that I've said about him because I thought it was their game to lose and they've lost it. That's what I've said. You know, they, 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 In a country that's got the problems that we've got, where the ruling party has got the problems that we've got, yeah, the, the, the road the, was wide open for them and they chose a different route. The DA, by the way, uh, there's a unity of opposites here. The DA is not different from the, from the EFF. When it comes to their attitude to criticism, the DA is extremely intolerant as a party, and and which is an oxymoron given that they would like to project themselves as a liberal party. So you would expect that they would be tolerant, they would come to a platform like this, even mm. if you don't agree with them. No, the EFF also operates like that. If they don't like you as a journalist, they simply don't come to your platform. So there's no difference between the DA and the EFF when it comes to uh, attitudes. And I'd like to say, if uh, John Stiernazen does watch this or anybody who works in his office, I'd gladly have you sitting right here, John, and we can talk it through. Uh, but now let's turn our attention to the EFF. You've mentioned a few times that you see them doing well. You also referenced earlier in, your, in some of your analysis that you look at performances by elections, the previous local government election. But yet uh, the EFF declined in the last election from the last general election. And everybody says, no, you can't look at that. Somehow that decline gets written off. They went from 10.9% of the national vote in 2021, and I do understand there's a difference with the local government election. They went down to 103 in the previous local government election, if you add all the votes in. Um, what have they done that's been so appealing since then that suddenly they're going to turn this stagnation around? N number one, the stagnation you're referring to is marginal. Yes, it's not but it's not growth. Yeah, it's not significant. Yeah, yeah I, understand. I mean, that's why I say stagnation. Yeah. Yeah, it's marginal. It's not significant. Mm. Number two, it's a bit complicated because it's local government elections. Why, what complicates local government elections? It's, it's, it's because it's, it, the local government elections have two components, and we have got to look at both of them. It's got the word, which is direct election, component, but it also has a, a proportional representation aspect. The EFF does very badly when it comes to ward elections. They almost don't win a ward. Just look at what happened, John is back and so on. You will see EFF local activists are not trusted by communities. This is a bottom line. That's what explains why the EFF couldn't grow in the previous local government elections. They were, they were held back by the direct election stroke ward component of local government elections. You don't have such an element when it comes to uh, national elections. In other words, that element will no, not be, will not come into consideration when it comes to the results of, of the national, uh, national um, elections. The reason why the, in the local government election, the EFF didn't decline badly it is because the proportional representation component actually went up. That's what explains. Yeah. That's what explains why the, the decline was not marginal. Although I'm not I mean, talking about uh, the seats or the proportion. I'm talking about the percentage of people that put an X next to an EFF candidate. No, no, no. Remember, no, no, no. Remember, no, no. Remember, there's not one EFF candidate in a local government elections. There are two. 
there is the the the, the ward councillor. Yeah. He this person gets a vote or this person doesn't get a vote. Mm. And then there is the image of the party, which is Malima. He, mm. He's also there in, in the local government elections. That image gets a vote or it does not get a vote. What has brought the what the EFF, that has been the shock absorber for the EFF, the image of the party. What will, in my, in my, in my view, what will explain the EFF growing? It's because one, South Africans are very angry with the ANC. They want to punish it. So the EFF will be used. Among other parties, by the way, it's not the EFF, only the EFF that will grow. There will be smaller parties like Action SA that will, as I said earlier, that will get something from it. So, so, so why? Because voters, in my view, are angry and they would want, they would want to punish the, the EFF. It's not as if there's something different or something new that the EFF has done. The EFF remains the same. The policies are well known. They're a chaotic party. Um, and people would like to use it as a, as a, as a, as a whip to punish the, the, the ANC. Not because South Africans, by the way, want the EFF to govern South Africa. If South Africans wanted the EFF to govern South Africa, it means that the EFF would, would grow very fast. Uh, but the EFF is not growing very fast. Yeah, well, you know, to uh, many people that comment on the state of the nation, very angry with me when I said that uh, I see the EFF being around the 12% mark because I haven't seen what they've done. I base that on numbers. And I can promise you those voters aren't listening to me, so you don't have to put uh, those comments comment away. But I promise you I'm not influencing any elections. But anyway, let's see how it pans out. I want to touch on uh, on some of the newer parties because we've had many of them here. And it, uh, I'm, I am get the impression that the real talent in the country is starting to – has gravitated towards these new parties, Action SA, Rise and Zanzi, Build One South Africa. That's where we do have very impressive people that I suppose in a previous time would have stayed in the ANC, grown up in the ANC, and by now would be cabinet ministers. Well-educated, articulate standards are high. Do you think that will resonate at all with voters? I mean, I know we've spoken about Action SA. We've got some track record to look at. They did stand in the last local government election um, and uh, you know, made an impact in the six municipalities that they stood in. The question is, uh, those other parties, do you think they're going to get to parliament? Rise and Zanzi, build one South Africa. Look, <coughs> you are correct in, in, in the picture that you paint. You can see that the smaller parties, Action SA, Rise, Mzanzi, build one South Africa, they attract the middle class component of the South African political leadership, especially the younger generation. Um, but the problem with that, the component that is attracted by these parties, is that they are way too rational in the way they conduct themselves. And the South African political landscape responds better to noise than substance, unfortunately. That's why the EFF is growing faster than this rational. I mean, think think of it. There was a, a party called Ahang South Africa led by Mampele Brampel, right? Mampele Rampele, with a record of leading the World Bank, UCT, and so on, she could not attract voters to her accord. Why? Because she, she was not a noisy politician, a very rational, wants order, and so on. So my worry about this new political party is that they are not appealing when it comes, they're not appealing to the kind of voters who vote for the EFF. And remember, the voters who vote for the EFF, that, that pool is actually bigger than the rational middle class, middle class voters. So I don't see this category of new parties, your Action SA, your Rise Mzanzi, doing well. Rise Mzanzi, if they get one seat in parliament, they'll be very lucky. Uh, build South Africa... One South Africa, if they get one seat in parliament, they'll be very lucky. Action SA now has a bit of a base because they did fairly well in Gauteng. I think that they're going to get something, but I don't see them above 5%. Yeah, look, I mean, uh, certainly one of the things that, that would set them apart from, say, the Khan, which I think is a, is a good example, is that these parties have gone out and built structures on the ground. There's, there is no doubt. They've got branches, they've got representation, they've got people. Mampela Rampela was just her. You know, they, they were hardly going out there to build structures. She was uh, just trading purely on her reputation, much like Bantu Alamisa, you know. Not really a political party, it's two men and a fax machine, you know, that kind of thing. 
these new parties seem to be putting their back into it. And it's going to be very interesting to see because I think they've worked out where they could, uh, they could get some support. Uh, and um, I don't see them wanting to go after the EFF vote. I see them wanting to go, to the, go after the disaffected ANC vote. Yeah, remember the EFF vote traditionally would go to the ANC. Mm. Um, and even the vote that you are talking about, which is the disaffected uh, conservative South African who has a family, wants progress and so on, black or white, that the vote that used to go, that vote, by the way, used to go to the ANC as well. Mm. So it's not as if these votes used to go somewhere else. They used to go to the same yes. party. So in other words, the EFF is going for a component of the vote that used to go to the ANC. Action SA and Rise Mzanzi and Build One South Africa, they're also going for the same, a different vote that used to go to the, to the ANC. You are right about structures. There's evidence that parties like Action SA, they have built structures. They have, and, and they have an advantage in the sense that they've been in the game for some time by now. But I'm not sure about Build One South Africa. I'm not sure about um, uh, Rise Mzanzi, by the way. Mm. They haven't proven themselves. We'll, the we'll elections will tell see. us. So now let's talk about the picture as a whole, right? Um, we, we've discussed parties and what we think is going to happen. Let's talk about the elections themselves. Are you, because uh, I do get asked this question quite a lot, do you think that there's going to be any issues with the elections in terms of the IEC's performance, the IEC's impartiality, and potentially violence that could uh, break out as a result of the elections. Where do you stand I, on this? I don't think so. <clears throat> Look, the IEC doesn't have a record of rigging elections mm. in South Africa. It doesn't have a record. If there was a, an election that was disputed, that ended up in court, and I would say there is a historical case. So the IEC doesn't have that, that record. By the way, there was a time when, especially in, the second, in Zuma's second term, when people were scared that that was going to happen. Given the scandals that Zuma was embroiled in and the image of the party that was broken, but it didn't happen. No party that I remember in South Africa on the opposite mm. side of things went to court and said the elections were rigged. Mm. So there's no basis actually to be scared. That's number one. Number two, the way votes are counted in South Africa, it's different from the way votes are counted in Zimbabwe, for example, where there's repeated rigging in mm. Zimbabwe. So in Zimbabwe, if you vote here... They don't count where you voted. They transport the ballot um, boxes to a counting center elsewhere. And in the space between where you voted and where the counting happened, something happens. There. That's where they steal the votes. In South Africa, that's not how it works. When you have voted, that's where the votes will be counted in the presence of voter agents. I mean, sorry, party agents representing all parties. So what gets transmitted to the... Um, to the uh, national center are the results. And these parties that were there when they were counted in a particular voting station have to confirm that I was there, I saw these votes being counted, and they append their signatures. That is why it doesn't mean that the ANC wouldn't want to rig elections. I think they would want to rig elections because they know they're not going to win this time around. But it is impossible given the way our electoral system has been designed and the way it operates. So I am on the side of the people who say, don't be scared. The ANC will not be able to rig an election. And number one, number two, I don't think there will be violence. Why? And I can give you a, a, an example. The ANC lost big metros, right? Nelson Mandela Bay, Johannesburg, Swane, and so on. People thought that there would be violence in those municipalities. There was chaos in the sense that there was political chaos in the sense that the parties that constituted the coalition governments from time to time wouldn't agree and they would remove each other and all of that. But there was, has never been violence in the sense of the metropolis shooting the new mayor. No new mayor was shot by the metropolis. By the way, the new mayors in, this, in these municipalities have been protected by the metropolis metropolis of these, uh, of these municipalities very loyally, by the way. So I'm not worried. Uh, the last point is, there are many men and women in our security forces, South Africans, black and white, who are watching this and say, we are sick and tired of the corruption of the ANC. We'll protect the country. And, and related to this, if there would have been a moment in South Africa where we would have witnessed, possibly witnessed a coup d'etat, it would have been when Tabo Mbeki was removed before he finished his term. 
The security forces were watching that, that, that political chaos. But no one on the political side could mobilize anybody in the security forces and say, let's carry, carry out a coup or let's defend Tabumbek. Mm. Why didn't they do so? They knew that our security forces, the way they are constituted, they are actually divided. You've got white South Africans there, black South Africans there, pledging loyalty to different um, forces politically. They will never, and they don't trust each other. They are watching each other. They will never allow anyone to carry out a coup. So there won't be violence after the elections, yeah. in my view. And uh, factoring the 2021 riots, what happened there? If we're talking about failure, yeah, uh, unrest and violence. Yeah, <clears throat> that was case. Uh, you're talking about July yes. in, in case at end. Uh, that was sparked by the arrest of Jacob Zuma. I mean, let's be honest about it. Before Jacob Zuma was arrested, there was nothing like that. So we can conclusive, conclusively say it was sparked by the arrest of Jacob Zuma. But obviously, there was also a criminal element. A very big criminal element, by the way. The looters were looting whatever they were looting because they wanted to go and use it in their own shacks, in their own houses. They, they were not looting there to go and contribute to a foundation belonging to Jacob Zuma. No. <laughs> it was a, an opportunistic element that took over that. But here is a, a, a thing about it. That um, unrest tested the state, the South African state. And what we saw from that is that the South African state is very weak. So if there were to be a nationwide uh, unrest, chaos, the South African state would not be able to handle it. That we know because we have seen it. But the South African state was actually in a dilemma. This is the aspect that most people don't realize. Can you imagine if you were president, Mike, at that time and you watch this stuff on TV, these people are running around. What would you, what would you have done? Would you have said to the army and the police, come together, go and shoot them down? If the army and the police had done so, killed 5,000 people during that, let me tell you, South Africa would never be the same again. So there was a dilemma. What do you do? Do you go murder them? Or do you, do you let it run until it comes to an end so that afterwards you can go re rebuild businesses, but at least you haven't murdered people? That was a dilemma. Let me tell you what I would have done. I would never have ordered the police and the army to go and murder people like they did in Marikan. I would have let it run and learn lessons so that afterwards it doesn't happen uh, again. And one of those biggest lessons, by the way, is intelligence. You have to strengthen intelligence. Intelligence was caught napping. If intelligence was powerful enough, strong enough, maybe that could have been avoided. I I'd like to close off uh, with something that's a little bit different, and that is that um, for as long as many of us can remember, the ANC has had financial problems. Suddenly, they don't have financial problems. Um, how do you explain that? The ANC has never had financial problems when it comes to an election. The ANC has financial problems long before. So in other words, the ANC doesn't care about paying its workers. The ANC cares about going back to office. Why? Because going back to office comes with the opportunity to steal state resources. So once you have you are back in, in, in government, you don't worry whether your employees at Lutulia House go hungry or not. So all the rogue forces have put together money in order to fight these elections so that they can go back to office. And remember, if they go back to office, they will steal more money. That's, that's the logic that drives the ANC. And it's as basic as that. In between elections, the ANC is broke. Comes an election, they mobilize resources because they want to go back and steal. Simple. Well, there you go. You've heard it from Prince Michele. Prince, thank you so much, as always, giving us really insightful analysis. Uh, I do want to thank everybody that's joined us. And I want to thank Pace Car Rental, our new sponsor. You would have seen the advert earlier in this piece. Thank you so much for all of your support to everybody that's watched us. Keep on subscribing. The channel's growing. We're becoming hard to ignore. And we're going to keep on bringing you top analysts and top politicians and get the picture of where South Africa is headed in this very important time. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you the next time on The State of the Nation.